Chris, the word is yours. I wonder where that liberty word came from. Um, <laughs> I'll start with a trigger warning. I am a lifelong nerd, so I speak in numbers a lot because um, I think they matter. So if we look at the broad sweep of human history, one thing that didn't vary very much was, was life expectancy at birth. It's been about 30 years, as good as we can construct throughout human history, before the invention of agriculture, throughout the ups and downs. Of course, it rose a little bit when there was episodic but rare outbreaks of peace or good, uh, you know, or success in agricultural productivity. And then things changed a lot just in the last couple centuries. Human life expectancy has gone from around 30 years to over 72 years today. Also throughout human history, about 90% of humanity lived on less than $2 a day in today's dollars. People were smaller because most everyone was in some degree of starvation. And then we've had this explosion, this more than doubling of human life expectancy. Instead of 90% of humanity living in dire poverty, today it's about eight or 9%, eight or 9%, still vastly too much. So what drove that? I, I think the two biggest drivers, the two biggest enablers of this change was the growth of bottom-up social organization, liberty, leads to humans to develop prosperity and creates fertile soil, of course, for beauty of all kinds. But that bottom-up social organization didn't hit the economic sector until the middle of the 1800s. The Registration Act in the United Kingdom, general incorporation laws in the United States, where we could shift from mercantilism to actual bottom-up economic organization. The other factor was hydrocarbons, this massive increase in available energy. These two things just transformed human society to be an unrecognizable state today. And now we have the ESG movement in the corporate, and I run a public company. We have an ESG movement that in big picture is attempting to reverse both of those. Top-down diktats about what values and what boxes you should check, and an explicit war against hydrocarbons based on sort of a mainstream climate narrative that goes something like this. There's an ever-growing climate crisis sweeping the world, wreaking destruction in its wake, particularly harming low-income people around the world, and therefore all the countries must unite in a battle to drive the fastest possible energy transition to cleaner, greener, cheaper fuels and only denying retrogrades get in the way and will be there soon. This is the narrative. The, the, what, there's one problem with the narrative. It's, it's simply not true. And, let, let, and let, me, let me hit a few of those things. First of all, the energy transition. The Kyoto Protocols were 1992, 30 years ago, it launched the energy transition movement to combat the climate crisis. We went from 87% of global energy from hydrocarbons in 1992 and plummeted all the way down to 83% today. 30 years, trillions of dollars of subsidies, countless government mandates, and we moved at four percentage points, and all of that in the low-hanging fruit, in the electricity sector, in wealthy nations. And even that small incremental movement drove up the price of electricity in direct proportion to the amount of adopting low energy density, intermittent, unreliable energy sources. It's driven up the price of electricity, driven down the reliability of the electricity grid. There's 10 times as many blackouts today as there was 20 years ago in the United States. This, transmission, this transition um, has not gone well, and it's not for lack of effort. It's because energy is hard. I went to MIT when I was young specifically to work on fusion energy. I worked in solar energy in graduate school. I worked in geothermal energy for years after that. And I am again today. I don't care where energy comes from. It just has to be affordable, reliable, and help lift humans out of poverty and better their lives. That's what should matter. So all right, so it's hard, it isn't going well, but what about climate change? Maybe that's just the price we've got to pay. But if you look at the data, the biggest narrative today is this extreme weather. 20% of kids report having nightmares about climate change, 20%. So does anybody know that last year was the lowest recorded hurricanes around the globe ever since we've had satellite data, 42 years of data. And of course, in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, there's no 
meaningful trend in hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts. The only two with a little bit of trend, tornadoes, we don't know why, are going down. And drought is gradually going down because a slightly warmer world is a slightly wetter world. Um, but you never hear this stuff. Politicians, the media, in our schools, um, again, even in the corporate ESG movement, this is a crisis. The IPCC also does economic analysis. William Nordhaus, a Yale professor, won the Nobel Prize on climate economics. You probably never hear the summary of this work either. The world's warmed about one degree C from a 50% increase in atmospheric CO2. And at the current rate of warming, we'll warm about another degree C towards the end of this century. So there's a wide range of economic analysis and we could critique and should critique who knows what the world's gonna be like in 80 years, but the range of projections of the impacts from this continued warming range between 0.2% and 2% reduction in per capita income three generations from now. So we're gonna lose a, a few months, maybe a year of economic growth in the next 80 years. You know, is that a crisis today? Is that is that, is that justification for all sorts of crazy government policy changes? Um, now look, the, the, the trade-off to that, what I call the true energy crisis today, also stuff you don't hear about much, a third of humanity, two and a half billion people, cook their daily meals burning wood, dung, and agricultural waste inside their homes and huts. Um, I've traveled to many of these places around the world. World Health Organization estimates this kills around three million people every year. Every year. That's the death rate of COVID the last two years for which we shut down the world. But these are low-income, poor people. They're, don't, they're, they're not politically popular. No one even talks about them or knows of them. This is a crisis. There's several million more preventable deaths from malnutrition and lack of access to clean water. Women in traditional societies spend about an hour a day gathering fuel wood and about another hour a day gathering water. Both of these problems are transformed immediately with the arrival of a simple propane cook stove and a little LPG canister. They call it liquid petroleum gas internationally. Incredibly easy problems to address. My company is partnering in Africa to help spread this fuel access. Two and a half billion people don't have that. Now you gotta weigh that against potentially a one or 2% reduction in global income three generations from now, when by the same economic models, everyone's three or four times richer than they are today. So it's real, climate change is real, there's data behind it, but calling it a crisis, calling it a justification to make energy more expensive and less reliable is simply dishonest. Look, look what's happening in Europe today, you know, crazy. Even wealthy Sweden has subsidies to help people pay their heating bills. The two fertilizer factories in the United Kingdom were shut down because of high electricity prices. The government had to intervene rapidly so they could put one of them back on because that's the source of industrial CO2 and without that you can't carbonate beer. So this was threatening, <laughs> this, this was the start of a real crisis. Um, <laughs> but Britain briefly decarbonized their beer. Um, so the, Energy poverty is not just a poor country thing. California has highest adjusted poverty rate in the nation today. 10% of Americans have received a disconnection notice on their utilities in the last year. And a larger percent report keeping their homes at unsafe temperatures, not cooling them enough in summer or heating them in the winter. Tens of thousands of people in this country die every winter. Low income elderly people is not keeping their homes at safe temperatures. So, look, climate change should be based on data and facts and traded off against other things, but it's not at all. It's just, a, it's just a political driving force that justifies control. It's not about reducing greenhouse gas emissions or bettering human lives. My response or, or response to this was to write a very different corporate ESG report where we lay out this stuff in more detail called Bettering Human Lives. That's what companies and humans should be focused on. Thank you, Chris. I'm an engineer too. I really appreciate the numbers. We'll get back into that shortly. All right, more uh, numbers to come. Mr. Alex Cranberg, our third speaker, is the chairman and founder.